Hi, it's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park, here with another sermon uh, on our Lenten theme of wickedness. Uh, today I'm going to read from uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. Um, as you'll immediately see, it's instructions for how to give a good life, probably given from a father to a son or a teacher to a student. Uh, Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. For they cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep until they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter until the full day of light. Excuse me, full light of day. Uh, but the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. These verses from Proverbs lay out two paths. One is the path of wisdom and righteousness and peace. The other is the path of folly or foolishness and wickedness and violence. I'm reminded of that time a few years ago when the Me Too movement was coming to prominence, when Harvey Weinstein was at the top of the headlines. Lots of women were explaining the terrible things that had happened to them, and many other women were going, yep, yeah, me too, these things happen. Now, we men had something of a bifurcated reaction. Some, like myself, were taken aback and said something like, what? Does that really happen? I mean, honestly? One commentator spoke about those men who were, quote, raised right, um, that these exploitive behaviors just wouldn't occur to us. Now, there was another group of men who were saying something more along the lines of, um, yeah, of course that happens. Uh, wait, is there something wrong with that? Yes. <laughs> I really like the comparison in Proverbs 4, 19 to 20. The path of righteousness is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not even know what it is that makes them stumble. I think that represents life. Some people, the wicked, they enjoy the things they can get away with in the dark. They like the thrill that comes from doing what is forbidden. They get a charge out of demeaning or exploiting others. Not so with the righteous. They are in harmony with their conscience. They act openly in the light. Rather than exploiting others, they care about them. They have empathy and compassion. Now, in the sanctuary this morning, I used uh, a little physical model of, uh, of a, a big punch bowl full of water, and on the water was a little boat and uh, the boat is sort of supposed to represent our life. And uh, what I said was that our boat would be a much better place if everyone acted righteously. But to transition, our boat is also affected by forces outside of itself, wind and weather and the turbulences of the water. In my little model, the water represents the bigger picture. It represents culture and all its flaws. It represents human sinfulness. It represents the debris of our accrued human sin since the beginning, the evil habits and practices that are passed from parents to children, the unfair systems that are incorporated in our cultural and national norms. These are things that usually have the word systemic in them. Systemic poverty, not just poverty, but it's built in to the system, the way everything works. Not just racism, but systemic racism that continues from generation to generation. Systemic inequality of gender. You could think of many more. 
That was the point of last week's sermon on Genesis 38. The woman Tamar was trapped in a system where women had no power except as they could bear sons for men. So Tamar actually acted righteously when she pretended to be a prostitute and tricked Jonah into impregnating her with her two sons. She did not make the context that led her to this, but she adapted to it admirably. She outsmarted the unjust system and the biblical writers praised her for it. I read this week about a doctor who falsified some records so that the authorities couldn't find the person they were looking for. So was that doctor righteous or wicked? You don't know the answer unless you know the context. In this case, the doctor was in Auschwitz during World War II. By falsifying records, this doctor saved the life of a young boy who was on a list to be executed. The doctor acted righteously in the midst of a sinful context. Unfortunately for us, the water around our little boat is always polluted. It is not always as bad as Germany in the 1940s, thank God, but it's always pretty bad in one way or another. We live in a fallen world which is longing for redemption. And so, in the 1940s, doctors have to work in concentration camps. In the time of Genesis, women have to rely on men so they can have children, so they can get an inheritance and have financial security. But there's nothing sacred about these world orders. And we seem to re keep recreating things like this. We all claim to be people of peace, and yet warfare in the world is constant. How does it happen? How does Christianity celebrating the Jesus who was killed for challenging the rigid Pharisees of his day also spawn the Inquisition centuries later? How does Islam, with its ancient vision of the Ummah, the beloved, er, the beloved inclusive community of peace, spawn so many suicide bombers? Things seem to go awry in the worst ways. How does a country founded on the ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness tolerate kidnapping people from another continent and enslaving them? How do you live a moral and righteous life if that is your context? The Underground Railroad was a good answer. Last week I read from Romans 8 about how this fallen world groans as it waits impatiently for the children of God to be revealed. Let me read a bit more of that chapter today. Romans 8, 31 to 39. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son. Jesus endured a lot of suffering. But gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall hardship or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No! <laughs> In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons... Neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is good news, my friends. Strong words. But it's hard to be a righteous person, and it's also hard to live a life faithful to Christ. There will be hardship, there will be persecution, there will be famine, nakedness, danger, etc., etc. That's part of what the passage tells us to expect, even as it's giving us the really good news. 
And the good news, of course, is that none of these things can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In my little model of the, the boat on the water in the bowl, God represents the bowl that holds the water. The bowl is solid and it doesn't move. And the good news here is that God is steady and reliable. We seek to be faithful to God and we literally cannot fail because God is working out the redemption of the world. God is the leader and we are the helpers. God is playing the song tune on the piano and we are just singing along. No matter how well things seem to be going, nor how poorly, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So yes, pay attention to Proverbs. Find ways to live a righteous life, picking the good paths and avoiding the wicked ones. And we do that knowing that the water around us is polluted and that all manner of things are beyond our control. Yet we will be faithful. We will treat people right. We will hunger and thirst for righteousness all through this world. We will work for peace and we will be faithful. That's what I'm going to try and do. I urge you to join me in that. Love to talk to you about it. Get in touch with me if there's anything you want to kick around. I'd enjoy it. Uh, may God bless you this day. Amen.